what is a definition? Beyond contentment. What is a contentment beyond definition? The world that can be controlled is not the only world. The world that cannot be controlled is undefinable. I Contentment beyond definition. To be honest, guys, uh, we are too compartmentalized. Every time I come to speak about it, it's as if there are all these different parts that have to be acknowledged in the same moment. <clears throat> and to be honest, I've asked myself many days. Many days I've opened my eyes and wondered, what is the dance? What is the plan? What is the purpose? What is the design? What is it that I'm not seeing that is happening? And as I've kind of gone after those questions, I've reached the edge of my own thought. So believe it or not, when deep, when deep questions are asked, they are pulling you out of um, <clears throat> the center of your world. And I believe there's two ways that deep questions arise. They either arise externally, your world wants to know something that nobody knows yet, or you internally want to know something that only your eyes don't know yet. You see, um, <clears throat> there have been moments in my life where it was as if uh, when I was younger, the ego, that you could put a greater sign um, towards my ego than towards my uh presence i did not care about how the universe was present i did not even care about how my moment was present it was all i all i wanted from my life was for it to listen to my ideology <clears throat> but what happened is i realized eventually the act of wanting to know the act of answering some of the deepest questions of this existence it's as if before you get the answer, the, um, the question changes. The mind that is asking the question changes. You know, as if you're, you're, you are asking a three-dimensional question in, in two dimensions. When you suddenly enter the th three dimensions, suddenly it's as if that question from the two-dimensional... Let, let's say it like this, like in, a, <clears throat> in an inferior reality, you're asking a question about the superior reality. And when you see the answer for the superior reality, the question for the inferior reality doesn't exist from the uh, inferiority doesn't exist. To be honest, I find we are elemental performers. We are the elements in the cosmos performing <clears throat> in accordance to certain designs or certain uh, extensions of the world. You know, it's, it's like the question the mystic asks himself. He's like, are my eyes only my eyes? Could there be a chance, for example, in Shintoism, the, these guys go next level. <laughs> Shintoism is like too badass, too mystical. In Shinto, they have this idea that objective phenomena, material, the material dimension is a vehicle. The whole dimension <clears throat> is a vehicle for a highway of beings. <laughs>
contentment beyond definitions it's like imagine you you'd never took off a t-shirt when you were like 10 years old now you're th like you're 20 years old and you're like the the, the, the t-shirt is like suffocating you you know and it's one of those things where the ideology has to change or you can't say your mind has changed pretty much any it's like this guys look at how how kind of humorous it is <clears throat> we look at the theistic perception free will moves towards divine will move towards the unknown intelligence and then we look at for example the um uh the free will if it chooses a material perspective it will go to emptiness that means in one manner of life if we choose objective reality to come first the conclusion is that our subjective existence our subjective realm feels empty to us if we think we're matter if we think we're subjects if we think we're the thought in the body rather than the body you know It makes the objective infinite because the mind is unknown. So pretty much when you feel like your mind, the universe doesn't have an end. When you feel your body, the universe has to end. I want to share a story with you. It's a story of Swami Shivananda. And I heard this story in a YouTube video from someone named Swami Vishnunanda. And Swami Vishnunanda was a disciple of Swami Shivananda and, uh, in India. And Swami Shivananda, believe it or not, he's, he's one of the most important yogis that has uh, walked this earth. Um, <clears throat> Swami Shivananda, there's a Swami Vishnananda says he was a young guy joining this kind of like monastery, this temple, and uh, the Divine Life Society and whatnot. And as he's there, he, he, like one night, he suddenly just gets up and feels something is off. He feels like there's something wrong. He goes outside of his room and he just goes outside and he suddenly sees the unthinkable that Swami Shivananda is, is, in, is in his night meditation. And then some person with an axe has come up to him and is constantly trying to hit the axe on his head. But the axe, instead of hitting his head, is sliding. Every time the axe is coming down to hit Swami Shivananda's head, the axe slides left, slides right. It's, it's like the axe doesn't want to hit Swami Shivananda, but the guy does. You know, something like that. And Swami Vishnuranda immediately, I don't know what happens, he tackles the guy or stops the guy or something happens where in that moment, eventually the police get involved and the guy goes to jail. The next morning, the disciples are all around the breakfast table, kind of like, oh my God, you know, Swami Shivananda could have died last night. You know, they could have kind of like, uh, you know, our, our beloved um, um, guru could have been hurt. <clears throat> Swami Shivananda eventually enters the room in the morning. And when he enters the room, it's as if he's, he's not even, a, he doesn't see the disciples. He just goes and gets a plate, like a big tray, and he starts putting fruits, different food and fruits on the plate. The disciples are like, okay, some days Swami Shivananda was known to go, you know, take his breakfast out to like, you know, a shrine or some certain altar or somewhere outside the breakfast area 
So the disciples eventually follow him, and they're like, "No, Swami Shivananda is not going to, <clears throat> is not going to the, what do you call it? He's not going to eat. He's taking the plate." And the disciples follow him, and they realize Swami Shivananda is going to to the jail. Swami Shivananda gets to the jail. The police officers already know of his name. You know, every pretty much everybody in that area knew who Swami Shivananda was. And uh, Swami Shivananda goes in there, <clears throat> and there's a moment where he asked the police officer to see the guy who wanted to kill him with an axe the night before. The disciples are watching. It's a very tense moment. The unthinkable again happens. Now this is where the moral of the story reveals itself. <clears throat> Swami Shivananda, they open the jail. He sees this guy, and Swami Shivananda is a big dude. I think he was like, uh, like he was pretty tall. And <clears throat> what happens is that Swami Shivananda, he puts the tray of food in front of the uh, the criminal, and he bows. He bows like full bow, head on ground to the criminal where he's placed the food and it's such an intense moment where the where the where even the police guards are tearing up and even the disciples and even the criminal the criminals like what you know and eventually Swami Shivananda tells them that it was not the criminal he saw the divine he saw all of it as part of this cosmic play that in some sense, that was not the criminal. That was the divine. That was the universe moving. <clears throat> and so what that means is he saw the greatest order in the greatest chaos. That means it's like there was no chaos. It was For him, it was as if God's mind moving that axe. It's a very profound story, you know. Uh, in the subtitle, <clears throat> by the way, the reason I shared that story is because um, that's a sort of contentment of mind where it's content with its expression. You see, it's like in the subtitle I've written the linguistic simulation, <clears throat> just to kind of uh, go through this quickly. Um, I, consider, I consider the moment to be present first. It's an existential meaning. That means the meaning is, it is defined. It's innate. So in the present moment, we find an objective component and a subjective component. I, I call these this objective realm and the subjective realm. And in each, the objective realm and the subjective realm, there's an objective self and a subjective self. Your physical, biological body is your objective self. Your, your, the idea that is dwelling in the attention when your eyes open, that is the subjective self. Now, the subjective self is more prone to change than the objective self. So when I say the linguistic simulation, that's why I say it's a simulation. It's a simulation uh, that in some sense you, you snap out of it and you can snap out of it in two ways. Either you go to the extreme of the origin of the cause of language and you come to silence. This is the ancient path. Now, now, the ancient path believed there was no other path. This was it. You had to renounce. You had to step out of the illusion to be true, to be the truth. But I, re I noticed that something doesn't make sense. Like, the, I, I noticed there was a kind of dissonance that if it is the presence of the being, if truth is a presence in why does it matter which way? That means it's like, why does it matter which, in, in, through which idea you realize you're not an idea? So I noticed that there is another way, you know, and this is kind of, I find, 
what the dance of my existence is here for, that it is the path of advanced communication. And what it means is if, if we went to the extreme of the cause, we can also go to the extreme of the effect and get liberated that way. What that means is through an advancement of communication to the point where the being does not feel they're either the objective or the subjective, they feel they're the witness. It's as if you tap into the witness through the intensification of the speed. So what I'm saying is either you stop completely and you find emptiness that way or you go so quickly as if imagine a cube and we're spinning it so quickly that you cannot see how it's a cube anymore you know that's the path of advanced communication another way of saying the being realizes they're the advanced communication of the universal sector you're 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 a cosmic being right now you're just identifying with what's around you And it's a big leap. It's a big leap from an individual being to a collective being because it requires many points of awareness to return to their natural state. And the issue is when you make an unnatural society in nature, man has to choose in accordance to where his location is. That means I'm telling you, whoever you are, if you go into nature, the pace of your mind will change. If you're in the city, the pace of your mind will change because how the world approaches you is at different speeds. That means it's like, for example, when you're in the city, it requires a quicker speed. Everything is, is much more sped up. But when you're living in, in like, you know, <clears throat> a very peaceful kind of nature area, like when I went to India, I was living in an ashram. There was a sort of simplicity there that complexity could not burden. So when we step out of the language, the language, <laughs> when we step out, uh, step out of the linguistic simulation, um, what occurs is experience takes over. But experience is not contained, but uh, conceptual, like the subjective self, um, it, it, if it's not contained, it'll feel either it's everything and nothing simultaneously. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means eyes are open in the world and they, there is options. There is an option to uh, work with the infinitude of manifestation, try to harness the powers of the endless universe, uh, endless observable universe, or in some sense wonder how our observance, is, where the limits of our observance are. You know, it's, it's like I'm telling you, uh, you, don't, you don't figure out who you are by just adding more uh, ideology to yourself. I don't find it works that way. If I ask you right now, if you think knowledge, somebody is knowledge and experiential, <clears throat> how do I say it? Someone who experiences something, I find is ahead than someone who just believes something. And when the person realizes their personality is kept by beliefs, their personality will only recalibrate, like, how can I say it? It's if the experience changes, the belief changes. So you feel you can't do something, you experience it, and you're like, oh my God, I could have always done this. You know? I find that um, what's going to happen is people's existentially, existential sensitivity is going to increase either through the extremes of desire or fear. Either we're going to get so afraid of the outcome that we stop doing what's wrong or we're going to want to do something. Uh, we do, we're going to want the right outcome to such a degree that we reach it that way. 
you know it's it, it, it's a very very strange game human existence it's pretty much like eight billion chess pieces on a rock <clears throat> and for now all the chess pieces are fighting but what if what if there was a reality that literally like you know how people go to the gym as a membership imagine there was a gym membership <laughs> For your civilization, that you actually opened your eyes as a human being and you felt like humanity was here. You're not just alone here, you know? Where decency is abandoned, chaos soon follows. What chaos breaks, a new order must fix. It's constantly like chaos and order are taking turns of how the appearance, uh, like literally the purpose of phenomenology is to change. You know, it's like picture. Uh, the, the thing is, the world is not a picture, but when we have beliefs on it, it becomes a picture. And uh, when we realize it's dynamic, that means it's prone to change. That means every human being that is born, and if they're willing to share their inner reality, eventually they're going to realize something has changed, as if you've added more drops to the cup and the whole volume has increased, you know? The worst thing that you one can say it's kind of like hard to see is when there is a tool that can be used and it's not being used. And I find that language is one of those tools that's not being used properly. The second thing is that we have to invent tools. And what is the greatest invention? I asked myself, you know, <clears throat> when I was uh, really young, I kind of wanted to be like Tony Stark before. Like I, it was fascinating. I remember I'd seen the movie by Centennial Man and just the concept of being able to create another uh robot and like like a robotic being was so fascinating to me but it's one of those things where when you wonder what is the best invention you'll see okay so the best invention has to consider that if the inventor the biological organic inventor was to invent inventions uh he will get tired at some point and stop but if the you create an invention that endlessly creates inventions, then you don't need to create anything else. Do you know? It's as if you have, uh, in some sense, created an activity that leads to results regardless of any other activities, you know? <clears throat> it's kind of like the person uh, through the Abrahamic context being like, okay, so after I pat, let's say transition, and there's that moment of judgment, what sense of self is the is, is the divine going to judge? Which version of me is 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 going to be seen? The world we live in and the world that lives in us and the self of the world that lives in you is one that wants the change to occur and the objective self it's fascinating no the body doesn't want to change but the mind cannot be alive if it doesn't change so it's as if our minds want us to change but our bodies don't and so there is this kind of conflict between where the value of life is um, it's kind of like this, I find, that the mystical path is one where you stop touching. It's literally like how Lao Tzu said, action through inaction. You stop touching thoughts. You stop uh, uh, letting uh, one mode of ideology just govern the, everything. Now, this doesn't mean belief is wrong. It just means that um, what you believe in, because you change, your access to the same design will be different. 
That means somebody knows what the concept of war is, but somebody goes to war and comes back and the concept of war is no longer the same concept of war. Even if they believe it, it's with a different intensity, with a di different experiential background. <clears throat> and uh, the contentment beyond definitions is a moment where the conscious, the pilot of consciousness has navigated beyond language. So literally, you're not a dualistic entity anymore. So you're not a creature anymore. You can't be because a creature is based on world and self. Self and world are separate. But this is a state where self and world are both uh, emanations of the same moment. And when you realize that something I find kind of unique happens, the unknown come, becomes your subconscious. What that means is at first the conscious is trying to find the unknown, but at some point in the middle, suddenly it becomes the unconscious moving, <clears throat> the unknown moving the known. Right? This is, this is the whole kind of allure of the spiritual experience that there were, uh, in some sense, uh, it's as if... Um, uh, we are. It, it, it was as if the person um, did not walk alone, as if there there were um, uh, divine agencies paving every footstep, you know. Or even those who entertain the notion of angels. You know, there's the cool thing is that I I realize it's like somebody I don't know who the guy was. Um, <clears throat> but he, he, this person had said this incredible quote that the difference between human beings and angels is that angels do not have the free will <clears throat> to, in some sense, make mistakes. That means angels are perfected individuals. They, their, in the, their individuality is no longer in, in their hands. It's, it's as if it never was. The angel is literally the limb of God. You can say, but man, man is uh, something much more unique, you know, in, in the Abrahamic context, it's as if God creates man and tells all the angels to bow down. And one of them says, no, the one who says no, long story short, becomes the dualistic dimension. <laughs> I don't know, some some nights, just there's some moments where I feel uh, if I choose to see a purpose to life, 
due to the mind imposing it, that it will be endlessly purposeful. And there's moments where I feel if I don't consider a purpose, that life can be endlessly meaningless. Therefore, what is kind of left is just the hand of the free will. As if you as a being are looking at your hand. You're looking at that moment prior to the inner being externalized. There's a Zen story where this man is meditating on the grass and he attains a level of like he's alone in nature and he, he just sees some truth about the world. The Zen story says there's a dark minion in another dimension. The dark minion suddenly notices. Suddenly notices this, runs to the Lord and says, yo, dark Lord, this guy just understood something about the universe. What do we do? He understood more about the truth, about the illusion. And the Lord, Dark Lord says, don't worry about it. He's going to make a, don't worry, he's going to make a belief out of it. And what that means is, is in every moment that man has tried to, tried to um, fly beyond the veil of thoughts uh, or penetrate the unknown or in some sense continue the conscious exploration, whatever his finding has been, he's, he's, he's done too much extracting he, in the sense that he's kind of, in order to make it relatable, uh, um, has has in some sense limited its value because I find there are certain static truths and there are certain dynamic truths um, kind of like how Buckminster Fuller says God is a verb not a noun you know so so, so in some sense it's this kind of notion um, where if it's a dynamic truth literally free will and the divine will they're just as long as you have free will, you think there's divine will. If you're in divine will, there never was free will. So either way, it's like through both lenses, <clears throat> through both sides of the polarity, there's a sort of void. There's a sort of uh, meaningless, as if something has a lot of meaning for you, but suddenly it doesn't. You know, because I'm telling you, especially when it comes to uh, human relationships and love, it, I find it, it just primarily has to do with care. You know, and care means that you have seen yourself, a pattern of yourself put in another, therefore you can comprehend how to care, you know. Now, this linguistic simulation, um, this is the unique thing. I, 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 so there's many times I've attempted to kind of throw a known spirit, an unknown sky, just to see what it could be like. But the way I see it is that eventually it's going to be a collective being. So right now we are 8 billion individuals. If there was an actualization of the collective mind, it would literally mean our minds are like drops of water on the windshield. And as they kind of hit one another, they merge. You know, so what that means is we are going to reemerge as a collective being as various uh, individual paths merge. Now, I'm not sure what this is going to mean. I'm not sure how long we're going to be individual creatures. I'm not even sure how long we're going to like technology is going to invade the natural existence, you know. So there's many, many things that could potentially happen. Uh, now I've I kind of reached a point where I'm like if I was a macrocosmic being the microcosm would be easy to have contentment with but only because we, uh, if I was a microcosmic being the macrocosm being would be as if like it's too big what can I do about it you know so it, it's like the contentment is led due to at some point the vision of the future becoming inconceivable or the vision of the past being inconceivable this is why i say it's so crucial to have a contentment beyond definitions and what that means is rooting your attention in the presence of your experience that means um be proud that you after four billion years are experiencing existence in the way you are you know it's um you know, it took me four billion years to give this talk, guys. <laughs> four billion years of evolution, you know, so. Uh, man can share his inner reality. <sighs> Ludwig Wittgenstein says the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And, you know, somebody probably looked at him and was like, yo, man, nobody's told you to shut up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Zen Master Dogen, uh, you know, I can I can say this story. <laughs> It's as if imagine some guy who's late to work. He has to get to work, you know. So as he's walking on the street, he suddenly sees that master Dogen who's in the market or something like right there. And he's like, hey, man, I got to run to work. Can you tell me what enlightenment is quickly? <laughs> and Zen Master Dogen probably is like, okay, this guy's actually honest. Like he's authentic. He's not, you know, he's actually doesn't. It's like his mind can hear things, you know. Zen Master Dogen t tells the man to follow Buddha's path. Or Buddha's way was to forget the self. To forget the self. And then he goes on, but to forget, then he says to forget the self. Oh, sorry, sorry, I got, I, I, I kind of skipped, skipped ahead. Here's the full quote. He says, to follow Buddha's path, you must study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to awaken to the nature of all things. So why is it in the forgetting of the self we awaken to the nature of all things? Because the self is a separation from all things. That means the conditioned child who's a member of society <clears throat> uh, may be a bit uh, not sensitive to all the complex ways that the mind is holding, uh, it can now hold its shape. What it means is there's observable laws and there's unobservable laws. And some of these unobservable laws are kind of indistinguishable uh, from... Uh, the context, I don't know how to say it. <sighs> Externally, energy can be reduced. So what that means is you got to maintain your external energy, but internally there just requires a certain percentage of wakefulness and then there's access. There's access to the deepest questions of life. And believe it or not, we are uh, moving to an era where we're going to realize we're minds projecting body. That means literally when we think we are someone in the moment, if I say, yo, I'm, I'm this guy in the moment. And then in, it's like literally putting a, t a thought on a changing body. And you can go on believing in that thought for a while, but uh, its value eventually, I find like for the next maybe 200 years, um, there's no necessity that much to kind of evolve language, but there will eventually come a moment where we're going to realize we can't see further with the technology. So we have to put down the technology and reinvent. And I find that what's going to come after language is going to be a child of light and sound. It's going to be literally um, um, <clears throat> uh, a geometrical language. Geometry now is being owned. It's like geometry is its own language, but it's being adopted by mathematical language. You know, you see, that means we're giving measurement to geometry, but geometry behind your eyes can be alive, can become alive. When geometry becomes alive behind your eyes, in every movement of it, it brings about, it evokes memories uniquely. So what that means is there's been times where I've kind of walked, uh, this happened to me when I was in Florida, which inspired me to kind of like write this strange kind of uh, in the moment book, um, which is called The Great Work, um, which is online. It's out there, but I'm probably going to uh, <laughs> uh, take it off and re-edit it and put it out there. I don't know. But uh, anyways...
I was walking and suddenly in the same space where visualization happens, I see this kind of inverted um, kind of triangle, but it was in a three-dimensional visualization. It wasn't a two-dimensional visualization. So what that means is suddenly that triangle replicates itself, that inverted triangle, and extends to the next block. So it was as if my visualization, my attention in the moment was using my visualization to in some sense animate what, uh, what my attention, if I was on the other side of the block, looking at myself would be looked like, uh, what, what it would look like. So it was a strange moment where the geometry of my subtler planes of my subjective realm became a mirror of my, gave me an objective outlook from the, another angle. So it was kind of like, how would I say it? Uh, um, attention rediscovering it's multi-local. That, that's another way of saying you realizing you're your whole moment of being rather than just uh, the changing contents in it. Now to find contentment with that whole moment of being is not, it's not an action thing. You know, some things are, are internal actions, which are realizations. Literally, it's as if the world changes, the inner reality changes. But in regards to external actions, it's like, that's different. You know, if you wanna treat the mind like an object, you're gonna think of wanting to do something about it. You know, kind of like, um, add, add something to it, but it's not an object. So pretty much the whole mystical practice, the art of it was like, what do you do with something that's not a thing? It's not an object. How do you treat it? And it was one where eventually you would, you would be led to contentment, but this contentment had to do with the rhythmic abidance with how your intelligence and the moment's intelligence are being the same moment. So that's another way of saying the moment is being your mind and your mind is being your moment. Surprise. <laughs> so, um, there's something fascinating in there. You suddenly feel as if your mind is not just being an idea of you, it's being everything that's held, right? So what that means is the human mind is like a glass orb that's, on in, that's in this material dimension taking the appearance of the material dimension. Now, when the mind wonders about its nature, it sees because it's the viewer of phenomena, it's not a phenomena. So what that means is the soul was always undescribable. Even the person who used the word soul, they're like, what are you talking about, man? And exactly, it's not an object. And it's not even a subject. That's why the word soul is one of the most unique words in, the, in, uh, in any language. You know, it, 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 it's, it, it's unique because it, it, it's, it's, it's literally a finger pointing to that which we, is inconceivable. The mind is conceivable due to its effects. What we say, the cause of the mind, um, or how the mind receives its expression, is unknown. I'm not saying that the mind doesn't is not projected from like the like the brain is not a video projector. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying that it's also an antenna. And if it's an antenna, when it wonders about its cause, it's based on its reception. So anytime the reception changes, a totally different framework of reality can occur. Eventually, once the being sees all the, it's like literally all the different radio channels you can change in on your car, eventually you'll realize it doesn't matter what you choose. So you, you, you enter a certain reality and you live in it. And now as you live in it, eventually I think it, this is the thing where it's like man is slowly evolving or slowly reaching a point where the secrets of the universe are being internalized. You know, what that means is, for example, I see an object in front of me right now. Let's say I'm seeing this cup. Now this cup, the gravity is keeping it on this table, okay? Now the thing is, this cup that's on this table I know that there's gravity, there's an external evaluation of the phenomena. Now this external, if, 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 this is an externalized approach, so I'm seeing something external first. Now, because I know gravity is keeping this object down, behind my eyes, I can visualize the opposite. So you can say the mind has a way of showing you 
um, the exact opposite of what the thought is in the moment. So the mind actually surpasses thought in the sense that it is a dynamism. So what that means is it's like the question is either how is thought moving or how is a thought being moved? And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, speaking through the school of thought that thought is being moved. That means you can move it, but you'll eventually see most of, most of it has to do with the externality. So here's the hilarious thing, guys. Our free will is based on external data that we have no control over because it's set to a certain laws, uh, universal laws, kind of move it. You know, the hands of the cosmos are moving things that our hands cannot. So anyways, I find, uh, as the sages would say, there's two things you can do in this life. You can either trust life or you can distrust it. You distrust it, you are also distrusting your mind that is being the whole moment, and it's the same. Any, even if you think somebody is your enemy, you're distrusting your mind in some sense, you know? Uh, so, but if you trust it, that's when uh, it's like life trusts you to a point where your eyes are they have the authorization because they, 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 um, the memory is not hollow because it's not an artificial self. So what I mean by that is that um, your attention becomes its own truth and it stays its own truth until it realizes what it thinks it is, is every, is, is the presence, uh, is, is a momentary presence. This momentary presence is another way of saying somebody feeling eternal beyond linear time. That means if you feel like right now, imagine I want you to just uh, think of a memory from years ago. And I also want you after you've thought of that memory, that memory's come to you. I want you to visualize something uh, that may happen like in the future, you know, like something, let's say uh, some efficient thing you do in the future. Now, those are both visualizations in this in, in, in this moment. Do you see? So eternity doesn't have to do with analysis because analysis requires separate dimensions, requires a lot of reference points, right? So this is why um, uh, <laughs> for a mystic, language is cute, you know? <laughs> Anyways, guys, I, I hope this talk was helpful. Trust your moment. It is where everything is happening. And uh, observe, engage, and recalibrate. When every moment becomes your treat teacher, that means it's like let the, the universe is teaching you before anything. Your experience is uh, how your attention is being the source of thought. Man looked at the cosmos and said, hey, cosmos. And the cosmos was like, what? And man was like, what are you doing? You know, and the cosmos was like, being you. <laughs> Nature doesn't succeed or fail. It just advances. Much blessings, guys.